be like 15 years now, right? Can't believe it. 15 I know. Years. We actually met at an entrepreneur's conference way back when, and, and um, we have been friends ever since. She has saved me more times than I care to say. <laughs> But um, I want to introduce to you guys Vanessa Parker. She is the co-founder of Divas in Defense, which is a family-run business that offers self-defense training for women and girls. Divas in Defense carries out the mission to empower women of all ages with training and tools imperative to their personal safety and the safety of their families. Her audience has seen her on stage at the Tom Joyner Fantastic Voyage, the Tom Joyner Family Reunion. She's been to Georgia Tech, Clayton State University, General, General Assembly, Black Enterprise. And one thing that was like, I felt like I was with her doing this during this journey because it was just so amazing. She partnered in Kuwait with Boston International Training and Speaking to over 800 women from 65 nationalities. I just like, I really want to jump in her suitcase <laughs> for that one. But I introduce you, introduce to you Vanessa Parker. She also owns Divas Empower. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. I'll let her share a little bit more about that or you can check her out there. But Vanessa, thank you so much, so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You know, um, I, I want to take a moment and just ask you to just share a little bit more about yourself. That was a great intro, if I may say so myself, but I want yeah. you to have a moment. <laughs> Look, me reading your bio was a great... <laughs> I love it. Oh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and some of the other things you have going on. So I am what people now call a serial entrepreneur. So I actually have a business, like you mentioned, Deep is an offense that I work with my husband. And I have a blog called Pink Boss, where I, it's kind of my place in the world where I share all things, uh, all the hats that I wear. Mm -hmm. I actually still work a full-time job too. So I'm a project manager for a IT company here in Atlanta. So all of those hats just kind of allows me to use all of my talents and skills. And it's yes. been so amazing, the journey that I've had that I haven't had to only be in one box. And so yes. I am grateful for being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And I, and, and that was one reason why I really wanted you to have you on is because we've been on this journey together, um, being in corporate America, and we've had private conversations about some of the things that we've dealt with. And, and one of them is the imposter syndrome. Yeah. So I, I, you speak all over the country, all over the world about imposter syndrome. And I want people at, to say no to imposter syndrome when they're at work. I want them to feel empowered. So first of all, for people who were like me, the first time I heard it, I had no clue what this was. So yeah. share with us, what is the imposter syndrome when you're at work? When you're at work, um, basically the imposter syndrome is feeling like you're a fraud. It's not being able to internalize your feelings, even though you have the evidence of success. So at work, that could show up in um, you getting promotion at your job and you feeling like you don't deserve it because it doesn't match your internal feelings of yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's it, good. It's up in so many places. I think it's something that it's kind of a buzzword now, but it was something that was taboo and no one really talked about in the workplace before. You know, I remember it is so interesting because you've been talking about this long before it was popular. And I remember hearing the word, not knowing what it was. And then when I learned what it was, it's like, people really need to talk about this yeah. because it's not just, um, it can keep you, even if you don't get the promotion, let's say there is an opportunity for a promotion and you don't apply because you don't think you qualify, that kind of thing. Oh, yes. Now that shows up a lot, especially when you're looking for a job. And, mm -hmm. you know, you look at that long list of things that you're supposed to qualify for and you only meet 80% and you're thinking, oh, I can't do this. I don't, I'm, I don't fit. But you fit 80% of the information. So mm -hmm. yes, it shows up in so many different ways. And I am on a mission to talk about it because I do think it holds us back from a lot of our potential mm -hmm. and for us to even take opportunities. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you. Um, so do you have a story? What, because generally when we start on a crusade about things and you've been doing this for a long time, it comes from a, a personal place. So do you have a story of 
an experience that you had that made you that that made you recognize the imposter syndrome and how you overcame it? Yes. So I have been a public speaker for probably the past 12 years and I have a girlfriend who's an executive at a very uh, fortune 500 company here in Atlanta. And I was talking to her about every time I practice for a session, whether it's a keynote or it's a webinar, I always prepare for a heckler or I always prepare for someone who's going to call my BS and say that I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, as I was practicing, practicing, I had a really big speech um, coming up and I was practicing with my girlfriend and I said, oh yeah, and here's the part if someone says, you don't know what you're talking about. And she's like, why would you prepare for that? I'm like, I always do, just in case. Are my facts straight? Do I have the data behind it? All of that. And she said, oh girl, that's called the imposter syndrome. I had never heard that term before. Yes. So because she's one of my smarter friends, I'm like, maybe I should know that word. So I go home and I do what you, most people do. And I Google imposter syndrome. And I was flooded with articles, papers, studies about this thing that I had that had been holding me back. Because after you start reading things, you realize, oh, it showed up this way. It showed up this way. And it made me do a lot of research. And so I'm a research buff and I just started researching everything. And um, that's when I decided I'm gonna start talking about it. So what I did was I started talking to my girlfriends. I called my friends. I went to my coworkers like, do you deal with this? And just about everyone dealt with it. Wow. So I decided this was gonna be my life's mission to at least start conversations. Now, imposter syndrome, the, the term is coined imposter phenomenon. And that was term, um, came in 1978, two like, um, psychologists here in Atlanta, Georgia, did a wow. study. Yes, they did a study over 150 women, highly educated women. So they were masters or PhD level. They studied them over a course of five years. And in that research, they realized that no matter their receipts, as we call it now, or no right, matter receipts, <laughs> gotta have the receipts. <laughs> or no matter their evidence of success. We're talking about masters, we're talking about dissertations, because I got B PhDs. No matter what, they all felt like a fraud. They couldn't internalize their feelings. Now, this study only focused on 150 white um, executive type women mm -hmm. because in 1978, you didn't see a lot of people of color in master yes. yeah. doctoral programs. Mm -hmm. So they really thought that this only affected that group, that core of people and mm -hmm. only women. Well, we know that to not be true. In 1995, 1985, Dr. Clance, which was one of the therapists, mm -hmm. created her own book and kind of debunked their own myth that after this research had come out that this hits people of color probably more yeah. men deal with imposter syndrome. They're just yeah. not as vocal as it about it. Yeah. So it affects everybody. It, it really doesn't matter. It affects, it affects everyone. That is so interesting though. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I believe that everybody is affected. I believe that we all have our own insecurities and I think some things, some of the things that happen at work don't necessarily help, especially if you hear little things from other people or even your leader that aren't as positive about your performance or about what they think about your potential or yeah. your performance, depending on the bar they've set. And some people keep moving the goalposts, right? So they what? say, you have to do this, you do that. Then it's like, oh, that's not good enough. You gotta do this, you know? And you keep trying to meet the goalposts, but you'll never meet it because it's constantly being moved. But yeah. then, they're making you feel like you're a fraud because you're not keeping up with their changing expectations. Agree. This is, this is, this is, this is really good. What, um, you gave some examples already about some things that could happen as far as the imposter syndrome at work. Do you have any other examples and how, what I want to do is I want to give some examples that says, Hey, if this happens, this is how you can handle it. Right. Yes. So what are, what, what are some other things that go on that make us feel like a fraud and how can we overcome those scenarios maybe? So let's talk about the goalpost thing that you mentioned. Okay. One, I think you have to define your own success level, okay. right? That's in your life and at work. 
right? So what is your level of success? You know, when you work in a company, they typically ask you, how are you contributing this year? You know, that review time comes. Yeah. What, where are you in, in, in this whole company? What do you contribute, right? So yes, you have goalposts that you're boss creates, but what are your goal posts? So it's like finding your own levels of success are super important so that you know when you meet those, you can pat yourself on the back and say, yes, I have met that success. Right. Because I think not just our managers do that, but we do that. We're so busy and we're so busy going from thing to thing to thing that we don't define our own success levels at work in places. So that's the first thing is defining what success looks like for you. Yeah. Um, will allow you to not have to chase after this goalpost. Now, the mm-hmm. second part of that is celebrating your wins. I love because it. Because we don't celebrate our wins. So you meet, you define your success, you meet your success, and then you don't celebrate it. For yeah. example, you, for me, I'm a project manager. Let's say that you started off, you were a junior project manager, then you move up to be a project manager. You go get your PMP to get certified and you go get the dream job. But when you're in the dream job, you never high five yourself and say, congratulations, I made the dream job. You still work on trying to be better and better and better. Yeah, We just keep going. We just keep going. We just keep going. So celebrate that win. Now, a couple of ways you can celebrate the win. You can make a win wall or so maybe post-its of the wins that you've had in your room, in your bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. You can create a, I call it an anti-fraud box but you can get a box from TJ Maxx or something and um, great things that your employer has said about you, an award you've gotten, or maybe a testimonial or something that your um, a client you've worked with at work has said, cut that out, put that in that box. So when you are feeling like a fraud, you can look at that and remind, remind yourself. Oh my goodness. I love it. You know, I love boxes and things anyway, of course, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I love the idea of a, a, um, it's not, what did you call it again? You have a win wall or anti-fraud box. Anti-fraud box and a win wall. And that way you're patting yourself on the back more often than, because there are going to be days when you don't have a great day, when you might've messed something up. And then that can really bring that imposter syndrome on where you're like, well, do I even need to deserve this? Should I even be in this role? Man, I really let everybody down. But then you can say, you, you can look in your box and you can say, hey, Everybody makes mistakes, number one. Number two, I am a rock star. Here's another way it shows up at work and a way you can combat it is you mentioned earlier about mistakes. We all make mistakes. We have to stop chasing perfectionism. Like we're not ever going to be perfect. So it's really, really important that we do not adopt a one or nothing mindset, meaning I did all these great things. I've been at this job for five years. I've done all these things and I make one mistake today. And so Mm -hmm. I'm a failure. I'm not good. I'm no longer a great employee. That one mistake does not define my entire career. Exactly. So you have to stop adopting that one or nothing mentality. We are all things and we are human and we're going to make mistakes. Own those mistakes. Own them. Yep. Right. Yeah. But. We've got to stop that one or nothing mentality. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. One thing I, I would also like to say is I want to get back to the piece of your leader or your peers making you feel like a fraud or making you feel like you're not good enough. I liked what you said about the box and the wall, having the anti-fraud box and the winning wall. You, we have to, part of that is building up our, our own confidence and saying, well, wait a minute, I, I made one mistake, or maybe this is a flaw in your personality and you don't necessarily know how to, how to talk to people or how to celebrate with people or how to uplift people. So just because there's a flaw in their personality and in their personal interactions, they don't know how to give correction in a way that is uplifting or encouraging or motivating does not make you a fraud. So I just, I just want people to know that. No, I totally agree with that. And I think that sometimes, um, cause we want our bosses to be proud of us. Like yes. that, that is human nature. And unfortunately all bosses aren't good. 
And you, that's why understanding who you are and making sure you're confident in things is yeah. super, super important. So I totally agree. Absolutely. So let, speaking of bosses, how, how can directors or executives or even managers, anyone who's in a leadership position, how can they help their staff and encourage them in this area? Well, at the core of imposter syndrome is confidence and support. Mm -hmm. You feel like you're alone. Mm -hmm. You feel like um, you're the only one dealing with this. I always tell people that imposter syndrome thrives in isolation. Mm -hmm. So as a leader and a boss, if we know that 70% of Americans will deal with imposter syndrome, that means that your employees are probably dealing with it. You may even be dealing with it. Mm -hmm. So being able to, one, if you are open enough to share how you feel about things, depending on where you are, some companies are a little bit light, um, laid back in culture, then I would share with your team at any point that you felt like an imposter. Um, another thing is to provide constructive criticism, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, you need to give criticism. You need to let your people know when they're failing at things, but also encouraging the support of things. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that you do the work too as a leader. You've heard before if you are too direct. You've heard before that your employees don't want to be around you. Like, I mean, learn to read the room, right? Yeah. You've, you've heard those things before. So you've got to do the work. It's your responsibility as a leader to build people up. And I think that when we talk about being leaders and we want to be bosses and we want to move up in companies, yeah. we have to do some training. Seek yes. out training on better communication with your team. Yes. Seek out training on um, the best way to provide criticism or to support. Because that's the core of imposter syndrome. It's confidence building. So if you're a leader who's not trying to build confidence in your teammates or that's not important to you, then you need to check yourself as a leader yeah. and do the work. There's books out there. There's classes. Yeah. There's things that you can do to be a better leader. I, th this is so good. Thank you so much. Speaking of books, what are some that you would be some good, easy reads for everybody to kind of dig in. So one of the best books out is by um, Valerie Young. It's a secret thoughts of successful women. Really? That mm -hmm. book, um, Dr. Clance and Dr. Imes are the ones that coined the term imposter syndrome, but I'm telling you, um, Valerie Young is the one who really, um, to me, put a lot of it on the map. So mm -hmm. her book is amazing. Another mm -hmm. one is by Chandra Rhimes. So if anyone watches TV, they know that Chandra Rhimes is an amazing producer of shows. Mm -hmm. So she has a book called The Year of Yes. Oh and my goodness. Yes. And she that book. It. Yes, it's so good. That book freed me. I, I mean, we don't need to talk about it here, but I wished when I was a single mother just really trying to figure things out. I wished I, I wish that book was around then yeah. to let me know it was okay. So we'll talk, that's, that's another conversation, yeah, that's another, but we're gonna the have year to of you know, yes is a must read for everyone. Yes. No, that one is good. It will have to schedule another discussion. Yes, about that. yes, yes. So many gems in that book. But a core of those gems is even though she's an amazing um, writer and she has amazing shows on TV, I mean, she like owned Thursday night, right? Yeah. She dealt with imposter syndrome even in her success. So that book is a good one. And my last one is Becoming by Michelle Obama. Yes, yes, so yes. What's great is now that there is um, a Netflix original mm -hmm about the behind the scenes of it, um, becoming, and it talks mm -hmm. about imposter syndrome. She talks mm -hmm. to other young ladies about confidence and imposter syndrome. Yes. So those are my three top books. Um, okay. But there's so much research out there. There are so many things out there mm -hmm. that you, um, and really pertaining to different industries, creatives mm -hmm. deal with imposter syndrome even harder than a lot of other people. Um, so in my project management role, I work for a digital marketing agency mm -hmm. and I, it all up and down in my team. So I try to provide tools and encouragement to them. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, those kind of jobs are all definitely called my imposter syndrome. So, and I definitely want to link to the two books, the study that you discussed, the, did you say Clancy? Dr. Clans, yeah. Dr. Clan, and then um, the uh, Young, what was her name? Yes, Valerie Young. Valerie Young. I definitely want to link to those so people can check those out. So thank you so much. Um, now, last question. 
you, you talk about this all over the world. When you're in your sessions, you know, whenever you're speaking, when we get off stage, you know, when you're speaking, you say, any more questions, right? Yeah. And then there'll be some questions, but then there's always those people who didn't want to ask it publicly. They want to come up, like they, they'll grab me at the end and say, you know, I didn't want to say this in front of everybody, but can you answer this question for me? When you're on stage just talking about the imposter syndrome, what is the aha moment for people? What is the one thing they come up, or you can share several things that they come up and say to you that um, it's like their aha moment when it comes to the imposter syndrome. So two that stick out the most. Mm -hmm. One is, and this is this last talk I've done um, has been over 200 people. And what I heard common was, in job changes is when imposter syndrome really flares up. And so as we talk about careers and talk about, especially this age, like we're in COVID, right? And we, people are like looking yeah. and reflecting on should they look for another job. Yeah. Imposter syndrome really flares during that time because you're going into something new. Even if it's the same yes. industry, even if it's the same, yes. you know, kind of exact same job, you're going into new territory. Yes. And us as humans, most of us don't like change. So understanding that if you know that's a trigger for you, mm -hmm. then when you know it's job search time, you got to really build up your confidence during that time. You've got to really go through all the successes, all the things you've done at your last job, all of that. You've got to build that confidence because you know that trigger's coming. So that's yeah. one aha moment I've had that was a common thread. Okay. The other one is people didn't have a name for the thing. People have been dealing with this, but never had a name for it. Didn't know what and it was, like me. Didn't know what it was. It was, right? So Ayan Vanzant says, you can't fix what you don't face. Yes. So if you don't know what it is, how do you fix it? Yeah. By giving it a name and by understanding that one, you're not alone with it, you can now fix it. You can yeah. find ways to combat it. Um, some of the tips I talked about today or any tips that you might find in any books, having the thing, and that's the biggest aha moment because people are like, oh my God, I've been dealing with all this all my life. One lady, my last call, I was literally in tears. She said, I have been holding myself back so much because I never thought I was enough. Aww. And in my talk, I think, you can't, you can't think you're not enough because you're already sitting at the table. You're at the table. You're already there. But oftentimes we're chasing this thing that we forget where we're actually seated and we're seated at the table already. Yeah. So From those one thing two, to another. Those are the two ones that are like the trigger of a new job and mm -hmm. not knowing what this thing was has yeah. always been an aha moment that I've heard after uh, I've talked about it. And I can see the trigger of a new job or um, going for a promotion. So for instance, if whether you've been laid off or whether you're like, it's just time for me to go somewhere else. And you're looking at these job descriptions and they throw everything in the kitchen sink in there. Right. And what, what I had to learn, and we've talked about this, I've talked about this with any number of people, you don't have to know how to do 100% of what is on that job description. Remember that they're, they're putting a lot of stuff in there because they're just throwing the kitchen sink in there. They're just like, put it all in there. They don't expect you to have all of those skills. Now, there are some things that are important for the job. You, you need to know how to do about 80%, like you said. Correct. But a lot of people, I've had to talk to many of my friends, many of my clients and said, hey, uh, it's okay, go for that job. And they're like, no, because it says I need this or it says I need that. And the other thing about this is, Let's say there's some software that you need to know. There are some things that you can learn, you know, while you're going for the position. If you spend the next two, three months boning up while you're going through that process of applying, Agreed. you know, exactly, exactly. So um, you, you've hit on so many great points. This, this has been so wonderful. I know it's going to help a lot of people. I really appreciate you coming on and talking about it because like I said, the very first time I ever heard the term, I kind of glazed over it because I didn't know what it was. And then when I, I learned about it, I was like, oh, right? So thank you so much for coming on. Please 
share with everybody how they can connect with you. Yeah, so I have a Facebook group where I share all things on imposter syndrome and self-doubt and I provide tools and tips there and I provide a little bit about my personal life and I like to be very transparent on how I navigate through my career and my life as a mom. So divasempower.net, you can find us there. And of course, on all social media, I'm at the Pink Boss, sharing again all the many ups and downs of life and how I'm even navigating my own imposter syndrome. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for joining us today. And I hope, listen, I hope you guys definitely check her out on social media and share, share, share. Thank you. Thank you for having me.